The theme of this article will be entitled, The Dangers and Implications of Sworn Blood Oath Secret Societies on Modern Society and Government. Uh, the assignment is given by Keegan Reed. The truest dangers of sworn blood oaths in American society and government is that too few people take them seriously anymore. In America, we consider ourselves a Christian country. It is 3,000 miles wide from coast to coast, but only a quarter inch deep. Even the Bible says it is better not to swear any vows at all than to swear one before God and not keep it. And yet, by the millions, Christian couples will swear the holiest vows before God and man in holy matrimony, and most will break those vows in a year or two and split up. And rather than right this terrible wrong, they'll protest any other couple's right to marry as against God's will. They will rabidly point fingers, and none will account for their own sins, nor do they want to. And we understand why this is so. John 3, 20. For everyone that does evil hates the light, and neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Even among the pagans who have dominated the world culture for so many millennia before Christianity had a very strong focus on the value of unbroken vows. Among Danaean witchery, a witch's power is manifest in their unbroken will and word to be considered wise, witch, the word in Gaelic. You had to be formidable this way. Among the great cities of the times, if a city had a library, it had a university because the library provided the curriculum. And as among many doctors, even today, and postgraduate doctors and stuff, have their Hippocratic oaths, most break them at will anyways, but there's the tradition. If one graduated the university, the next thing was the postgraduate or the mystery schools of higher learning. But one could not study in one without first taking the first curriculum to know how you read and assimilate knowledge and pass it on and everything, and without taking a blood oath that you will use the craft you learn there for the benefit of your community and not for profit at the expense of others. All witches, druids, sages, and mages were bound by the same oaths this way, worded a little differently depending on the, on, on the particular your cult or sect. But among those were unscrupulous magi that broke with the tradition and decided to use their craft to glorify and enrich their own coffers at the expense of everyone. Among the Keltoi, the new term was coined in Gaelic, warlock, meaning oath breakers. They met in secret. And the reason being is they were an anathema to everyone they came into contact with. Their holy language was Latin, the trade language of bankers and scholars of the day. Does it tell you something? It speaks volumes about what they truly valued above all of the wisdom they learned in such schools. Among the sages it is considered as fact that one can never serve two masters, God or mammon, wealth as it were. It has always been proven to be a corruptible mixture. Jesus himself spent no little time railing against such things, but 300 years after his crucifixion, it was pagan warlocks that changed the focus of his life's teachings and kept their flock's focus on how he died and filled them with dread and church doctrine and dogma instead. It didn't matter that the master railed publicly against the religious Jews of his day because they used their traditions and doctrines of men to make the word of God to none effect. Nobody reads that stuff but the priest, and surely they wouldn't lie to them. But note that Constantine, who was the patron of the Babylonian mystery schools until his deathbed baptism for what that was worth. He was a sworn by a blood oath to them first of all. What could his allegiance to this new religion possibly be when weighed in the scale of his own word and actions? For all of us, our words should be our bonds. Yea always means yes and nay always means no. Any departure from that is a walk away from honesty before God and man. When a man stands up and publicly proclaims to a certain course, it should be a given that he will spend his life trying to achieve that goal. But for the secret Luciferian sects who have infiltrated every aspect of our lives, it would have been so. But because of their wealth and power, people accepted these types as pillars of the community. 
They see the Masonic rings, gestures, and hand clasps and think that these are respectable people. Like their own promises, they forget that these people are pre-sworn to another agenda already, and it has nothing to do with your well-being, but only their own. They are warlocks, oath-breakers, and they use the craft they learn to their own ends to control others for profit. They cannot serve you or their oaths, which are taken very seriously by their brethren, would have them murdered for treason to the group. If they were secret beyond the eyes and ears of the public, this would be an understandable mistake to put such a person in charge of anything. Their deal sour on their lips as they speak them. Their handshake is your undoing, unless you are wearing the same rings. In America, most who hold any great power are high-degree Masons. The same is true of many of the captains and finances of, of finance and industry. And their occult symbolism of their craft is shown publicly on nearly every document that they deem important. And the ignorant masses wonder why their lives are so hard, and yet others stand out in fatness and suffer no ill thing or war. Why is it when people in power promote artists and such to spread their illusions and visions. And when the artists are rich beyond their dreams, they take their own lives in despair because they know what they have sold their souls to and cannot bear it any further. It is better to end your miserable lives than to find yourself in opposition to a God who will never be impressed with your trinkets. Judas Iscariot understood this. Masonic rings or no, some clergy live and preach to continue raking in wealth and power from their congregants. They too have broken with Christ and served their own appetites. Their loyalty is in question. But who questions such archaic things like loyalty and integrity anymore? We've pretty much decided to take on the warlock doctrine for ourselves and cast our values aside as inconvenient for our times. We've become a part of our own worst problems when we do not hold people accountable for their oaths. Our solutions were to join the other side and hope to win something. Everybody knows the dice are loaded, but everybody's rolling with their fingers crossed. To me, as a born and bred pagan witch, Jesus was the Logos, the Word made flesh. To a first century pagan, Gentile, that was a very grandiose claim to make. But if we couple that with the image of a man who makes no occult hoodoo moves, but simply speaks the dead to rise, the lame to walk, and the and the wind and sea to be still, now we have a reason to stop dead in our tracks and follow this man, even to our death if needs be. And history, and the accounts of history, prove this out. We understand the power behind an unbroken will and word, and that the author of such could and should do no less. Take also the Magi, who could predict his coming in the stars. They weren't of the warlock ilk either. They saw and they understood what they were seeing, and they put their lives at risk to finance the first dozen years or so of this babe's life on earth, and they misled Herod away from him. They weren't Lutherans or Catholics. They were pagan and wise, that's witch and Gaelic, and their oaths were intact. I would never expect Jesus or even them to behave any differently. Neither would I expect Luciferians, Masonist, and Illuminist warlocks, or people whose holy language was nothing but a trade language, to have interests in anything pure, except to defile it as they have, time, time, and again. Sworn oaths, be they in blood or mere words, are very important. If the track record of the speaker shows they have no respect of such, such respect should never be given to them or to put them in any place of honor or authority. By their very nature, they will defile it. They are unqualified to even be believed. Neither there should there be evidence that they have sworn fidelity and allegiance to any other cause that would take any precedent over the promises they make to the people present. Their loyalty and allegiance is in question, 
put no faith in them. At this very moment in history, we as Americans find ourselves murdering and torturing others in the dubious name of a freedom that we don't have, and even in God's name. Can you imagine that? You chasten a person who simply says Jesus or Goddamn as if they were taking God's own name in vain. Is something profane, but it, you excuse everyone else with a funny collar or an expensive suit who will outright mi misrepresent God's name and will for their own personal agendas. We find ourselves supporting the side that misrepresents God's name for personal profit and our undoing, and yet no one wants to see themselves at odds with God. Exactly what God are we talking about? There seems to be some confusion here. We have been fools and not the least bit for Christ's sake. My too tightly wrapped Christian ex-wife kept voting for Republicans because they were right to life party. As if that excuses everything else they do. She still thinks she's voting for God's causes as she does it. In all of her years did she see a single one of these Masonic reprobates do anything about abortions. Never, and she never will because warlock doctors make money breaking with their Hippocratic oath to perform them, and their money owns the politicians who will keep the mo money flowing in spite of dead babies. In fact, they are murdering babies and much, much more besides in civilians all over the world for profit as well in illegal wars, such as what they always were, and they declared themselves by their blood oaths, but we somehow expect differently of them. That part is the craft being worked on us. And as every dollar bill is an occult talisman to bring a certain sect of warlocks more power, they are hopelessly wrapped up in the illusion. They believe the lie. Most Christians don't like Solomon because he rubbed elbows with too many pagans. Most pagan witches listen and read anything from Solomon. Here's what he had to say of this. You'll find it in Proverbs 26, verses 1 and 2. As a snow in summer, as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, the curse causeless shall not come. Curses don't happen by accidents, people. He understood that. Witches understood that. Everything we say or do comes back us. On us, at least threefold, depends on what group you're in. Not just in the sweet by and by, but sometimes in the right here and now. Has it occurred to any of you that the world we live in today is accursed? Or that America's troubles might be an indication of God's displeasure, in spite of all our yelling and bumper stickers proclaiming, God bless America? Do you begin to understand why that's not going to happen? And what kind of turnaround? repentance, if you will, that it's going to take from all of us to change this. Here's something I wrote almost a decade ago of what I have observed of my country in my time. The poem's called The Mighty Fallen. This is the land where I was born and grew up. This nation was known as the Lord's Golden Cup, a land of abundance overflowing abroad, a land gone corrupt and turned far from God. A place where the truth is forsaken for lies, where the honest and stalwart are feared and despised. A place where judgment will soon come calling. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Deny your own heart and your actions are token. Warlocks hold sway with promises broken. We want it all now, make it cheaper and faster. Common folk groan under a heartless taskmaster. Having sold all of your virtues, you're a mother of whores. Terrible tidings awash all your sores. I've heard the voice of the angel calling. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Through God's own desire, he would have been healed. But you said it was he whom should give way and yield. Trust the will of a man as the ultimate power. But they all pass away like a plucked withered flower. We are rich, we are powerful, we've nothing to fear. But we're sadly mistaken in what God will hear. In a single hour, said the angel quite solemn, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Fifty bright stars 
come together as one. Show not what we were, but what we've become. Place a hand on your heart and bow your head in deepest humility. Sing this instead. My country, tis of thee, who sells our liberty to foreign kings. Land where our soldiers die, serving a naked lie. If God were really on our side, freedom would reign. This was written by me, John Storm.